When you take the material and the approaches to subnetting that I'm going to teach you in, the next, in this section, and then you combine it with practice, you are going to become an absolute subnetting surgeon. The reason I make the comparison there to a surgeon is that when our surgeon walks in the surgery room, hopefully that person's not thinking, oh, I hope I remember where the femur is, or you know, what, what chamber of the heart am I working on today? They walk in with total knowledge, they know exactly what they're doing, and that's where confidence comes from. And this is the section where people's confidence tends to waver a little bit because it's new to them. And when I taught this in person, you know, people would try to sneak out before we got to the subnetting section. But this approach is gonna be the total opposite for you. You are going to soak in everything that I t show you here, everything I teach you here. And when you walk in that exam room on the big day, you're there and you're already certified as far as you're concerned. You're, you're just there to make it official. And that's what confidence means, especially when it comes to subnetting. Because when you see subnetting questions come up on the exam, you're gonna say, great, give me another one. What else you got? Now, for those of you who are totally new to subnetting, that's kind of what this particular video is about. So I wanna show you what we're doing, talk a little bit about why we're doing it, and then we're gonna talk about some hidden challenges with subnetting that seem to come in with subnetting a little more than say routing protocols. So enough preamble that Tony Soprano would say, cut the preamble and let's get to the thing here. The concept of subnetting, it's really simple because what we're doing is taking what is officially called a block of addresses and we're just cutting it up into smaller pieces. We're segmenting it, we're cutting it up, however you wanna put it. But I have found for those new to subnetting, and maybe even those of you not totally new to it, I have found that a circle or a pie or a pizza makes a better visual, and that's what we're gonna use here in a moment. Now, I realize this is a little off topic, <laughs> or it seems that way. But let's say that you have two hungry people, and you have one pie, or you have one pizza. You have two choices, really. You can give the entire pie to one person and let the other person go hungry, or you could cut the pie into slices and give each person a slice. Now that second choice leads to another set of choices. You know, how big is the slice gonna be? You could take that pie, cut it into halves and give each person half, or you could cut the pie into multiple slices and give each person a slice that's big enough to get by on, but you save the other slices for other hungry people who just might come along later. Planning for future guests, I guess you could call that. Well, before you send out for food, before you leave and go get a bite to eat, let me show you exactly what I mean by all of this. We're going to start with the unsubnetted network 2000-8, represented as a pie, a pizza, a circle, shape of my head, whatever comparison you prefer. But this is the only address block that we're allowed to use for our network in the following walkthrough. I'm going to work a, live, a little bit of live equipment in here as well. And here's how we start. We have this giant circle of addresses. We have a block of addresses. And what we want to do is know when we have to subnet, know when we don't, and then of course we've got to know how to subnet. All kinds of great stuff coming up with that circle. But what we're gonna start with here is a simple one segment network. And this is about as simple as it gets. I didn't even put a router number or a router interface on there. And if this is all we had, you know, one network segment, we could use that entire block of addresses here because only one network segment exists. There's no reason to share. This is comparable to having one hungry person and one pie or one pizza. And you just say, hey, you know, here you go. Here's the whole thing. Enjoy. But we also know that if this is as big as our network is, we probably don't have a job as a network admin, right? We're only going to have so many difficulties there. So what we want to look at instead is something a little more realistic here. And we've got a router with two interfaces and we have two network segments. And this is where subnetting actually comes into play because I literally cannot take that entire block of addresses, 20000-8, and use them on both sides of the router. And that's a term you're gonna bump into once in a while in Cisco documentation as well. You can't use addresses from the same little block of addresses or same large block of addresses on more than one side of the router. Now, let me show you exactly what I'm talking about. I'm gonna go ahead and bring the live equipment up here. And I was gonna save this for the next lab, so forgive my impromptuness here. I like to call it audible for myself too, it keeps things fresh. Let's say that on the two fast ethernet interfaces on router two, I want to use addresses from the 20000-8 network. 
with no subnetting. I'm just going to use two addresses I pull out of the sky from there. And I go to my first interface and I give it an address of 211 and watch your mask here. And then I go to my other fast Ethernet interface. I'll make it the next one just to make it fun. And you're going to get an odd message here. And this will pop up every once in a while. It's a good message for you to see. Such and such network, the network you just added, overlaps with another interface. You know when you'll see this more in practice, really, is with loopbacks. Because if you're working on live equipment or a simulator that allows you to create a lot of loopbacks, and you get a mask wrong, or you've already added you know, one address from a certain subnet, then you go back and try to create one later. It's going to give you this message, kind of gives you a hint something's wrong, but doesn't tell you, what do you mean overlap? Well, that just means that basically what I'm trying to do right now is use addresses from that same network, 20.000.8, on two different sides of the router. And as you can see, the Cisco equipment isn't even going to let you do that. So it's not just theory, it is definitely real life. So this is where subnetting comes in. I've got to take that block of addresses that I have, or that pie of addresses, and I've got to cut it up into slices and give fast e the, the network on fast Ethernet 00 a slice, and I got to give a separate slice to fast Ethernet 0 slash 1. Now, knowing when you have to subnet is half the battle, because knowing is always half the battle, right? Well, the other half is making the right slice, you know, determining how large this subnet should be. And that decision is going to be made by analyzing the answers to these questions. How many subnets do I need overall, including those reserved for future growth? Hello. Sorry about that, but <laughs> I got italics, I got a different tone of voice. I really want to point this out because the one thing we can't assume is that our network is always going to be the same size as it is today. Can't make that assumption. If you're going to assume something, you should assume that it's not going to be the same network, you know, six months from now, six years from now, certainly. And if I do this, let's say I'm looking at this and I'm looking at that pie of addresses, I'm looking at that block of addresses. Well, if I just slice it in half and assign addresses from half of the block to the left side of the router and the other half to the right side of the router, what happens when a third network segment gets added in the future that needs addresses from that same subnet? Like I said in the, in the little requirements we talked about, this is the only block of addresses we have to work with. Ah, so you see what I'm talking about, because you could go back then and re-subnet it into three slices, but then you're going to have to change some address. It just gets to be a mess. So you are much better off leaving yourself some breathing room when you're subnetting, and that is reserving some subnets for future growth. Of course, the other question is, how many host addresses are needed by each subnet? Well, let's go back to our, our network here. I say additional hosts. But I don't say how many additional hosts. And as you're going to see in the coming videos, this is a very important question. It's one of the first ones we're going to ask. Because if you handed me this at a client meeting, a client meeting or I saw it on a PowerPoint presentation, whatever, my first question before I'm even asking about what IP addresses we're using, I'm saying, how many additional hosts do you have there? And you know what I'm going to do there? I'm going to plan for future growth there as well. I'm going to leave myself some breathing room. If he says 62 hosts, I may not slice that pie or create a block that only has that many addresses. I'm probably going to leave myself some. Again, you'll see this in action in future videos in this section. I just want to hit this with you now. And we're always planning for future growth. But as you'll see, the answers to these questions and the size of the slices, the size of the address blocks we create, it really comes down to, again, how many subnets we're going to need overall and how many host addresses are going to be needed by each segment. Now, what I've got on the board here for you is just reiterating something I just told you so we don't have to stay here long. Uh, again, we want to subnet as efficiently as possible, but we always want to leave ourselves, to use the unscientific, unofficial term, some wiggle room with your subnetting for any hosts or any networks that you have to add in the future. Now, I talked about that hidden challenge of subnetting. We're, we're hitting the 10-minute mark, but let's stick here. It's just another minute or two here. Um, you know, the thing is, as network admins, 
when we go in to work, you know, the thing is we're not configuring a network from the beginning every single day or from scratch. I like to use my grandmother's language once in a while. <laughs> uh, you know, we're not setting everything up from scratch, and we're quite grateful for that. You know, it would be horrible if we went in at 9 a.m. and you know nobody could do any work until we built the network again. But the same, you know, so the main part of our day. Uh, we're adding services to our network, adding hosts, that kind of thing. But a lot of us, most of what we're doing is troubleshooting. And again, the same goes for subnetting. We're not going to walk in every day and subnet addresses and assign them from the very beginning. And we may find ourselves in situations at client sites that demand answers to these questions, you know, connectivity issues. You have to be able to look at an IP address and say, okay, I know what subnet this is on. And sometimes you can look at the address and the mask and just know it without doing any calculations, but sometimes you can't. We're going to see both scenarios. What's the broadcast address for this subnet in question? Because 255, 255, 255, 255 is not the only broadcast address. Every subnet is going to have one, and we got to be careful not to assign it to a host. You'll see why. But the thing is, we have to be able to calculate that. We also have to be able to say, you know, what is the valid address range for hosts to this particular subnet? Because someone could have gone in. The thing is, you could come in after someone else has done the subnetting. That's what's going to happen most of the time in the real world. And to be blunt, that's what's going to happen most of the time on job interview questions, practice exam questions, and most likely real exam questions. You're not going to be doing all the subnetting from the very beginning yourself. You're going to be analyzing troubleshooting and frankly fixing what someone else has done so you got to be ready to come in from a client to a client site and they got four hosts and they can't figure out why one of them can't talk to the other three well maybe they're not all on the same subnet but the client thinks they are maybe they're using an IP address in that subnet that they shouldn't be using and the thing is you've got to be able also to look at their network look at their subnetting and say, okay, I know how to get the ballot address range here. So we are going to learn all three of these skills. They're easily learned as long as you get in a lot of practice. Now, that's just what I said here too. I got one screen ahead of myself. But well, we're just about ready to jump in. We're going to start with some fundamental calculations and then we're going to get a little more complex, a little more complex. We'll be coming in in the middle of some scenarios. You know, and then finally, at the end of it, we're going to be doing some you know, meet the requirement questions. Because what can happen is you know, Cisco could hit you with this, but a client site will too. Just say, you know, here, are the four regular, here are the four requirements you gotta meet for our subnetting, you go out and meet them. Because the one answer that looks right at the beginning may not be the right one, but once you've practiced the skills in this section, you're gonna nail all of them. I'm, I'm happy for you in advance because I know how well you're gonna do. Take a breather and we will get started. Make sure to get something to write with because we're gonna do plenty of that in this section, especially with the video that's coming up next. <laughs> 